Welcome inside episode 623 of the Locked On Senators podcast. I'm Ross Levitan on the outskirts of enemy territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba, alongside Brandon Pillar up in the Blue Mountains. And if you remember last Friday, we discussed Corey Pronman's rankings of the top under 23 programs in the National Hockey League. Well, today, Corey joins the show. And Corey's not the only guest on this show, Ross. Not a big deal, but we have a hockey hall of famer, a ball hockey hall of famer as our Sen Central citizen. A two-person guest show. Let's get to it. This is the Locked On Senators podcast, your team every day. Locked On Senators, your daily podcast on the Ottawa Senators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Senators your first listen on this Wednesday, August 31st. We are free and available on all platforms, including on YouTube, where the best way you can help the show grow is to like every video by clicking the thumbs up and subscribe to the Locked On Senators channel, where you'll get exclusive YouTube content like the Behind the Blog feature we're putting out every Saturday and Sunday, and our organizational value rankings that will continue with Tier 3 Tomorrow, so they are getting ever so close. We are into the top 25, but Pilsy, these players on the top 25, a lot of them are already in Ottawa and skating at the Sands Plax. You can sense the season getting closer, Ross. The boys are back in town. And hey, shout out to all the Sens fans on Twitter that are going to the practices and getting video of the skating drills. Uh, we saw some Jake Sanderson, a lot of Shane Pinto. Uh, and so we're getting to see these guys how, how they look at after an offseason, especially guys like Pinto, Sanderson coming off injuries. It's great to see them back on the ice. So shout out to all the Sens fans that are giving us this exclusive video. Please tell me you saw Kevin Lee's post with Pinto and Jake Sanderson. Yeah, Sanderson's photo bomb. Yeah, that's a Did great Did you one. see it? I'm going to pull it yeah. right up here and shout out at Bring Back Lee. Kevin Lee. <laughs> that, that is all time. Look at <laughs> Woo! Woo! Absolutely loving it. These are two players that Corey discusses with us on our show today. And if you're not following Corey, I mean, that's a must follow on Twitter. And The Athletic, they're they're known for their long form. Well, I think Corey took it to a whole other level with this project. Yeah, I mean, ranking pipelines of players 23 and under for all 32 teams, like... Ross, we have a hard enough time uh, getting this done for the Senators, let alone all 32 teams. So big props to Corey for doing this. And he is a wealth of knowledge, as you all know, and you're about to hear on, uh, on our next chat. Without further ado, here it is. Our chat with athletic prospect writer, it's Corey Pronman. All right, we now welcome a very special guest back to Locked On Senators. It's the NHL Prospects Analyst with The Athletic. It's Corey Prodman. How are you doing today? Is it finally time for you to relax after this big project after the draft? You finally take a few months off? I'm not sure about a few months. Uh, the, the, <laughs> KH, the, the KHL starts uh, tomorrow, as well does the Champions League. So, uh, you know, probably not a relax may not be the, the word I would use, but it, it'll be a lower... Um, it won't be as tense a period and no deadlines to hit. That's for sure. Do you get in depth with uh, leagues like KHL and uh, the leagues overseas when they start, or are you just kind of waiting for, for highlights, clips, big stories, or are you actually kind of following along those seasons? Oh, I know you follow along those seasons. Those are important leagues, the SHL league, uh, uh, KHL in particular, but even the lower leagues like the Osvensk and yeah. uh, the, the VHL to some extent, the MHL definitely. I mean, you have to yet to keep it, you have to kind of, I mean, that's where all the, the, the high end players in those countries are. So you have to at least have some sort of pulse on what's going on over there, especially in these few, these first few weeks before the NHL and, and the CHL really get going. Uh, that's a great opportunity it's when a lot of the, the NHL scouts typically go overseas too, just so you get like an idea of who some of the, you know, the new players in those age groups are and anybody who might be doing well early on in some of those big pro leagues. Uh, so no, you definitely have to follow them. I love it. There really is no off season, especially in the scouting calendar. And we appreciate all your hard work. Your most recent project is the NHL pipeline rankings. And when it came out, at least the one we were most interested in on Friday, we we made the point of of how 
we appreciate this a little bit more than just a prospect analyst be, or uh, rankings, I should say, because whether the guys in the NHL or not, I think this one has a lot better indicator of how the whole system is progressing. For a guy like Brady Kachuk, he was off prospect list by the time the next draft came around. So it kind of felt like it was taking away from the system. So I like how you do it. It's the best players under 23 in the entire organization. I mentioned Brady Kachuk's name. He made this list by one day. And I know your cutoff is the draft. Ottawa finishes fifth. If Brady Kachuk had aged out, how much do they drop off? I mean, it's hard for me to say exactly. You have to kind of go through it, but there would be a, you know, probably it's more like a five to seven spot drop out yeah. of that. And it was because just because he's such an important player. And again, the reason why I do, I chose to use the age cutoff instead of a games played cutoff that would have probably graduated a guy like Brady rather quickly, uh, whether it was within one or two seasons, whether he did, you know, 50 games or 100 games or even 200 games, um, is because I always felt that when you graduated players who were already in the NHL uh, and you did these type of say prospect pool rankings, it, it would maybe send false indicators, I think, to, to readers about you know how bright or not bright the future is for a particular pipeline. You know, if you would have done this one in between the Brady and the Stutzel drafts, it would make it seem like there's no talent coming for Ottawa in the future, which would be a poor indicator of what you can expect over the next five to seven years. Uh, there's no perfect way to do this. I've done these type of rankings now for over 10 years. And whether it's an age cutoff, a games played cutoff, uh, you're going to misrepresent one, some, one organization. You're going to um, have somebody feel like somebody got slighted. You know, someone would say, you know, for example, in Ottawa, they'll say, well, why is Eric Branch from not on this? And it's like, well, you know, he, he graduated because of age. It's like, but Brady Kachuk's still on it. But that I, I can see the illogical inconsistencies. Uh, but you got to c- make the line somewhere. And that's where I chose the line. Yeah, well, you only make lists for people to get mad at, right? That's why you guys make the list is so you can hear all the all the angry and um, uh, the unpleased comments, right? Uh, not not in particularly but that tends to be the end result <laughs> yeah definitely so Brady obviously is number one right under him is Tim Stutzla at number two that's probably how most Sens fans would rank things now what is the biggest kind of difference uh between those two when you had them uh ranked well they were even though they were even though they're, they're in like a different tier when you actually read the ranking. If you actually look at the overall player list I put out on Monday, they are really close to each other. Like if you wanted to argue one or the other, I wouldn't call that uh, unreasonable. I think with Brady, the one thing I would kind of say with him over Tim is that he's not only an excellent player, they're both really talented players, excellent hockey players, but he's a little bit more proven at the NHL level, you know, just came off a huge year. Where, you know, I think there was a little bit of a, a finishing issue in those first few years in the NHL, but but this year that wasn't the case. The shooting percentage went up a couple of points, scored 30 goals, uh, was a captain as a very young player on an NHL team, an NHL team that probably could have had a little bit more success if their goalie could have stopped a few more pucks. Um, and, you know, he plays huge minutes. And like I said, there's been a lot of success there. So, and obviously, you know, great toolkit, big elite competitor, has good skills, all that kind of stuff. Even though Stutzel's toolkit might be a little bit more dynamic in terms of what he can do with his skating and and, and the puck. But uh, that's the mild separated there for me. You know, we could get to a point, you know, in a year or two, if if Tim uh, pops off, like I think he has the potential to, where we can yeah. maybe say things are, are different, but but Tim hasn't done that yet. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Because last year you had Timmy first, but then like you said, Brady was able to finish a little bit better around the net. So that was that was something that pushed him ahead. Yeah, like I said, again, it was mild at the time then in one right. direction. Now it's mild in another, another direction. You gotta give Brady credit for the year he had. I mean, he's you know emerged as a true, you know, star power winger in the National Hockey League. If you pulled most NHL personnel right now, they probably list him as a top 20, 30 winger in the league at the moment. So you you have to give him a nod then in that regard. Good problem to have. Two prospects making Corey Promen's top 10 with Brady Kachuk at number five and Tim Stutzla at number eight. A lot of debate in the Sens uh, Twitter verse and, and among fans is Ridley Gregg and Shane Pinto. And the long-term outlook, we know that the Sens are trying to acquire a top four defenseman. It seems like those are the guys who are being asked of 
by other teams. I noticed there was a bit of discrepancy between where you had Shane Pinto at 66 and I think Ridley Gregg around 125. What's the biggest difference in their game that pushes your opinion of Pinto a little further ahead? Well, I think Pinto's accomplished kind of the same argument we said before. Pinto's accomplished a little bit more at higher levels. College is hot, is harder than uh, than a junior level, and he also, in his brief amount of NHL time, has shown quite well. I think if you look at the pure toolkits, uh, you know they're 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 close. Uh, you know, Pinto's a little bit bigger, but I would say Greg's a better skater. But they both have you know good offense, good two way games. Uh, you know, Greg may be a little bit more physical, but Pinto's a responsible two-way center, again, with, with a little bit more size than Greg does. So I think that's they're close in that regard. But uh, Pinto, I think, just has proven more at higher levels. That's why I would lean towards him. Um, presuming everything's fine with his medical, but if he, you know, I kind of presumed when I did this that he's, you know, this was just a one-off injury. Yep. He's going to come back next year and be perfectly fine. If that wasn't the case, maybe things are a little different, but uh for now i would i would lean towards pinto for those reasons so quick follow-up on that pinto greg or a 2023 first round pick i know the top end of the draft seems like it's going to be one of the best you've seen in a while if the sends are going out and you're advising the gm which one of those pieces would be the most untouchable the most untouchable i would lean pinto in 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 those in those three i mean Because you're Correct. hoping that the yeah you're hoping that's uh, a latter latter half of the draft. I've seen enough lotteries, Corey. I've seen yeah, enough. I, yeah, but I mean the draft's so hard to predict a year out. I mean the the, the draft last year was supposed to be remember there's the Shane Wright, Matthew Savoy, uh, Brad Lambert draft, and then things change a lot in in twelve months. I, I like the top you know couple of guys in the twenty three draft. You know, obviously no Connor Bedard from Regina, Matt Mishkoff yep. from Scott, and Fantilli from Chicago all look like you know you know true high end prospects and there's some really good players after that but it's hard for me to say this is going to be an amazing draft class when when we're only recording this in august right now there's there's a lot of games left to be played and i would think you should if you presume that ottawa will with the improvements to their team and the improving young players you're hoping will be maybe realistically a middle of the league type of team i i would say i would let's say let's say they picked let's just say let's just say 15th overall yeah. next next year i would take shane pinto over a 15th overall pick heck yeah and then and then um and i would and then in terms of greg versus the 15th that's closer i think that would make you that that's that's one where you would probably have to see where greg does as a pro as a first before you start thinking about it love that yeah that's definitely fair i'm with you on the presumption that uh the sends uh will probably be middle of the pack in the draft and hopefully be less concerned about the draft because Ross and I are getting very tired about talking about the draft every single year as our at uh, least prize in the spring. Jewel. I yeah. like doing it in the in the late May, early June, but when it's April and we're talking about, I just want playoffs. Yeah, that's that's, that's what we're hoping for uh, at least. Uh, now back to your list uh, for Ottawa. Who is your biggest riser and who is your biggest faller uh, within the Sen system? I mean, the biggest riser was definitely Zach Ossipchuk. Yeah. I mean, I, and he was a guy who, when I watched him um, in that in, in in his draft year, I saw some things that were interesting. Like, you know, he was a big guy, he competed well. I saw some offense. Uh, I did not appreciate, or at least I didn't see it at the time, how good a skater he was. And when I saw him in Vancouver this year, maybe not in the first half of the year, he kind of was just okay with the Giants in the first half. But that second half, and particularly into the playoffs, uh, he was really impressive. He turned he turned a lot of heads around the hockey world. Um, and, you know, it led to that invite to the U-20 team there with Canada in the summer. Uh, you know, you, you, you see a guy who's a 6'3 center who can, who can skate, who can has at least some offense, who plays hard, he gets to the net. I mean, that's a guy you can easily see being a bottom 6'4 in the National Hockey League. I feel pretty confident he's going to be a bottom 6'4 in the National Hockey League. Uh, is he going to have enough offense to, you know, be a true secondary scorer in the NHL? Uh, I, I don't know for sure. Uh, but but that's a guy who I think has a has a pretty good chance to to play games and, and help a team win games, at least the bottom of the lineup. In terms of biggest fallers, uh, probably Marilinen would be okay. the guy. You know, he, he kind of struggled this year in the OHL. His World Junior didn't really help his case either. I didn't really move guys much off that World Junior. is kind of a weird tournament to be moving guys too much off. But just in general, he just struggled in Kingston uh, this season. And I think if you're looking for the goalie of the future in the system right now, I mean, he's got a chance to play. There's some good, there's some good things about his toolkit, but I think Matt Shogart is, is the guy right now in terms of the goalie of the future. 
I like that. And and we're big Mando guys. We just had him on. So we're going to pump his tires a little bit too. But yeah, Sogard, obviously a little more proven. And uh, I think if he gets his consistency, uh, obviously the toolkit on, on Mads is huge for, uh, for sure. him. So I like that. Uh, just final question for me, actually, maybe two, because I need a quick rundown on the 2022 draft. Only one player made it onto this list. It was Tomas Hamara. What can you say to introduce Sens fans to him and what kind of player can they expect now? getting to see him almost in our backyard, at least in the province, playing with Kitchener. I thought Nordberg was on there too. I could be mistaken. I think he, about he has a chance to play. He was in yeah, the, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think Hamara, just a, you know, a nice little, well, it's a well-rounded defenseman. Nothing about his game is going to be really stand out to you, but he's a good skater. He makes a good first pass, a decent sized player who can, you know, I don't know if he's going to be an amazing defender, but because he's got at least some length and good and good feet, I think he, he defends fine. Particularly as a junior, he's got a chance to be a good defender as a pro to go with some secondary offense. Kind of guy I kind of see as a third pair defense in the National Hockey League. Maybe a chance for more if the offense really improves over the next couple of years. Uh, but but that's a you know because I, I liked where where they got him in the third or the fourth round. I mean I I think that was I, I liked him in that spot of the draft. Nice. Yeah, I thought it was good value for Hamara there as well. Now, sticking with the uh, defenseman, and final question for me, Corey, thanks so much for taking time to join us this morning, is a lot of fans, similar to the Shane Pinto, Ridley Gregg debate, they're looking at JBD and Lassie Thompson as two guys, like, okay, where do we have these guys slated? You had Lassie Thompson ahead of JBD. What are the biggest differences between their game right now? I mean, one thing was just Lassie, I think there's just more tools there to work with. I don't know if JBD's ever going to have much offense and then the question is okay he doesn't have a, he doesn't have a ton of offense i think he's a good skater he competes hard but he's not the biggest guy so it's like I, it's he's not he's a good skater i want to say he's an elite skater so the question comes to jbd is okay where does that fit in an nhl lineup where you know do 6-0 defensemen who don't have a ton of offense you know those guys don't usually play a lot of minutes unless yeah. they're exceptional at a couple of things and he might be his competes really high but it's it's that that's the question and, and whereas Lassie also I would say there are some inconsistencies in his game there's I wouldn't call him an amazing defender um, and the offense was good in Belva much better. you know he's shown progression from where he was a year ago I wouldn't say you know he put up massive amounts of offense but at least you can see a guy who has good hockey sense he has a good shot he skates well there's potential there to be a, maybe a second power play guy in the National Hockey League um, he's probably got a you know maybe take a little bit more of a step to show exactly what his role is going to be in the NHL. I can't sit here today and tell you for sure this guy's going to be a second power play guy, takes a regular even strength shift in the NHL, but but he's got a, a chance to be that guy. And I think he's going to play games. I think he's going to help the team at some point, but that's kind of where I would follow with those two. As I, I would, I would, if someone said they're going to be a top four defenseman, I would, I would challenge you to say, well, exactly how, do, what do you see to say that's going to define that role? Whose jobs are they taking? Uh, that's where I kind of struggle with those two right now. That's fair. I think w when sense fans are positive about JBD, it's almost like he's so unspectacular that it's spectacular in the way that but, like, yeah, I, I, but, I think, I, Shabbat. but I think he's going to play, but is the question right. is like, okay, is he like a third, just a third pair guy essentially, right. or can, if he's top four, it's like, why is he top four? What's he so exceptional at that makes him top four? Right. No, that that's fair. I found it interesting too, that you had the K train Tyler Clevin a little bit above both those guys, which I like, I've always been a Clevin guy, but do you think that there's enough offense there or that the decision-making will be good enough at the NHL level with him? No, but, but that's not why he's rated there. He's rated yeah. because unlike the question I just asked you with those two, I think the answer to with him is, is more affirmative. And I can say, I can right. see the path for him to become a third pair defenseman is, is quite clear. He's six, four, six, five. He mean. skates really well. He's really physical. You know, there's, you can, you know, you can, and I, and I hear this from NHL scouts about Clevin all the time. You know, it's, it's very easy to see a path where uh, their coach is just going to play him 16 to 18 minutes a night and give, have him kill penalties, take D zone faceoffs. It's not hard to envision that path for him to be kind of that that type of defenseman because that's usually what the third pair defensemen look like. They're big and physical, and they you know they have those defensive zone uh, situational usage. And then when they it's when time to score, they get off the ice. You know, so that's that's where I would challenge on like those other two. It's like where exactly do those roles fit? But with Clevin, I see the role pretty clearly. I love that. That's a perfect breakdown. I'm gonna we saved the most contentious. For last, this is my final question. Again, we really appreciate you joining us. You're already following him on Twitter at Corey Prom, and the work is in the athletic. 
always worth the read, especially if you go to his pinned tweet right now. The, the link will take you to every single team's under 23 rankings. It's a one-stop shop ahead of your fantasy league, whatever it is, to get to know all the up-and-coming talent in the National Hockey League. You know where I'm going with this already, Corey. It's Tyler Boucher. Yeah, it's the most polarizing sure. pick in the entire draft. If we take away where he was selected... He dropped two spots for you here. It was an injury-riddled season, 24 games with the OHL, even less in uh, NCAA. What does he have to do next year to get you on board with having him, let's say, top 10 on this list? Yeah, I, and I think it's possible. You know, if he has a little bit more consistency, pros will lose a little more offense. Some offense, I'm not expecting a ton of offense, but at least some um, stays healthy. I think he's going to make the world junior team. If he actually can, you know, do decent at that level, that's good. That, that will help him. I heard he had a good camp there for USA in, in a summer, you know, with, with Boucher, I never disliked the player. Even when he was drafted, I didn't dislike the player. It's, a, it's, a, you know, you go back to then. And I would have said if they would have picked him in the twenties, I don't think anybody, at least me, I wouldn't have criticized that. That would be like, yeah, that's not where I had him ranked, but I, I see the argument. That's kind of where Tom Wilson went. You're making the gamble there on a guy who plays and with elite physicality that he could really develop, get a little bit more of a scoring touch and, and become a really valuable piece, a unique piece in your organization. Uh, it's unfortunate that since he was picked in overall, his development took the worst possible path possible over the, over the last year. If you could give me, you know, give it a, plausible set of alternatives in terms of how his year kind of gone this was one of the worst ones where he kind of you know doesn't make it work at BU he transfers gets injured doesn't score the you know, OHL either so it's unfortunate that, that that's what happened but I still think there's a good player I think he can project as I thought a year ago as a bottom six winger in the NHL provides a lot of physicality and I think there is a path to maybe be you know a middle six winger if, if again he needs be more consistent offensively, maybe get a little quicker with, in, in his skating. But but there is a path there. I, I just kind of feel bad for the kid because, you know, he doesn't ask to get picked 10th overall. He doesn't ask for the, he doesn't ask for the scorn. Uh, but, you know, it is, it, it's the decision they made and it, it, it hit big questions. Uh, the one thing about that pick that was always interesting to me was the player type that they clearly covered was a guy with, you know, tremendous physicality and compete. Uh, and I always kind of wondered, you know, I get why they went for Tyler, but but the next pick was Cole Sillinger and he was a guy who played a lot like that and provided offense too. So that's, that's the, where the, I think the debate kind of fell for me, but because I do like Tyler, I think he's got a chance to become a, to kind of rise up the prospect ranks. I think he's going to play in the NHL, uh, but obviously the last 12 months have gone a little tough for him. Bill, see that sound familiar? Yeah, I was a big Cole Sillinger guy as well, Corey. So when uh, they selected Boucher and then Sillinger was right after, I was like, well, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and time will tell in terms of who ends up being the better player. Although right now it, it, it's kind of one-sided, yeah. uh, but we'll, we'll see how the next few years go. Yeah. At least, I mean, Sens fans are excited. At least they get to watch them in, the, in our own backyard now playing with the 67s. Corey, we appreciate yep. all your analysis and joining us this morning. All the best. We're going to be reading and following along and we look forward to the next time we get to chat with you as well. Yep. Sure thing, guys. Thank you. Stick to to Corey for joining us. Really appreciate the insight he provided. And I like how he admitted, he's like, no matter what I do, there's going to be at least one that I get wrong. So if you want to hold it against him, feel free. But I like that humility from him. And he clearly puts in a lot of work doing this. Yeah, it's insane the amount of work he puts in. And, and the fact that he's able to kind of just off the top of his head, uh, know or at least have a synopsis about every player we ask him. And when he said he gets into the KHL as soon as it starts, I was like, oh my God, this guy does not take a day off. I meant to say weeks off. I said months and his yeah. reaction was all the time. <laughs> He's months. like, I haven't had months off in, in a decade. Yeah, what a guy. That's awesome. We go from what a guy to what a lady. Alicia joins us. She's a ball hockey hall of famer, diehard sense fan. We brought up Bring Back Lee. Funny enough, Alicia actually brings back Lee in her chat with us as they are two of the top jersey collectors among Sens fans. So, without further ado, actually, let's have a little ado. Pilsy, <laughs> let's pay the bills and then get to this week's Sens Central Citizen. Just a quick ado, Ross. Not a, not a long one here. And, Ross, if we could bet on ball hockey, 
I would be very confident that betonline.net would have great odds for whatever team Alicia is on because as you're about to hear, she has some accolades uh, when it comes to ball hockey. But it's not just hockey that betonline.net has. They got football, basketball, baseball, UFC, boxing, whatever US you Open. want. US Open, yes. Whatever you want, they got it. All the latest odds, totals, player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land. Once again, betonline.net is the number one spot for all your sports betting needs. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Get informed when you're making your bets. And the best place to do it is betonline.net, where the game starts. All right, let's get to our Sen Central citizen. It's Alicia Demir. All right, we're now very pleased to welcome this week's Sen Central citizen, and she comes with a closet full of accolades. A four-time ball hockey world champion, a recent inductee into the Ball Hockey Hall of Fame. It's Alicia Desmere. Welcome to Locked On Senators. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. How are you guys? Fantastic. We really appreciate you joining us. It's been a long time coming. How did you become a Sens fan? So I was a Winnipeg Jets fan. Uh, I moved to Ottawa in 96 when the Jets uh, moved to Phoenix, so it kind of worked out. But I tried to be a Coyotes fan for a few years. Um, I happened to meet Daniel Alfredson at my school. There was a poetry contest that some girl won. I got invited to go. Um, and then Daniel Alfredson spoke to me after the class. He didn't need to, but he found out when I played hockey, kind of talked to me about my hockey career and kind of what was going on. And I was just, like, awestruck by him. So I became a Sens fan that day. That's awesome. So did you follow uh, Daniel Alfredson a little bit more closely after that? Oh, yeah, I became obsessed. It was a little bit weird. But uh, <laughs> as anything with sports, I do become quite diehard pretty quickly. So unfortunately, I tried to still follow Coyotes a little bit, but it was a little bit harder at that time when uh, we were still in dial-up internet. Right, yeah, you can't just turn on and get every single game right at your fingertips. That makes sense. So Daniel Alfredson's talking to you. That just sounds like right in his realm of character, which is, is awesome why he was such a great leader for so long. Uh, did you start – I feel like you said you get obsessed pretty easily. Were you wearing number 11 after that too? Did it go that far? No, unfortunately it didn't go that far. Uh, number four has been my number forever. Um, number 11 was too sacred for me. I didn't feel like I could live up to his uh, stature at that time. What an answer. I love that. <laughs> Phil? Yeah, that's awesome. So what, uh, what are some of your earliest memories as a Sens fan? Like when, when you're thinking about uh, starting to follow the Sens, what are some of the moments that uh, pop out to you? Uh, unfortunately, I feel like a little bit of playoff disappointment was a lot of the moments. Because yeah. um, <laughs> it was early 2000s that I followed them. So knowing they were like president's uh, champions. So I was all excited. But then every playoffs, Toronto. It was just disappointment. But uh, anything Don, Daniel Alfredson did, glorious. Better than Matt and Dean, come on. Yes, easy. That's <laughs> easy. So that would have been, if I'm doing my math right, probably around like the 2000 mark that you became a Sens fan, give or take? Yeah, exactly. Oh, man. So how fun was 2003, though, where we avoided the Leafs in the playoffs? Oh, it was a great time. I, I still cherish that moment. But, uh, yeah, unfortunately after that, not so much. No. <laughs> Until 2007. Oh yeah, that was fun in itself. Which playoff? Which team do you think was the best Sens team all time? Was it oh three, oh six, or oh seven? Oh three. Yeah. That was my favorite. Yeah. Okay. That was a good team. Still had Hosa in the mix as well. Yeah. Pavlat was coming up. That was a, yeah. that was a real good team. Oh yeah, that was my favorite. It was so hyped for that, and then no. <laughs> no, I know the next year was so tough. I just yeah. have the 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 visual of Lalim reaching over with his glove, and it's like, come on, just nice yeah. little blocker, just follow it in the corner. Uh, so, what position do you play in ball hockey? Uh, right wing, but I can play any forward position. But right wing is usually my favorite because I like the one time clapper on my off wing because I'm left handed. Yeah, that's awesome. I love it. Um, so, who are some of your other favorite senators growing up? Like, no, whether it was the O three team. Or a little bit later on, like maybe someone who you took pieces of their game into yours or just someone you enjoyed watching from far? Uh, probably Mike Fisher at the time because I'm more of a power forward as my game. But um, unfortunately, now knowing how Mike Fisher is, so you should never really meet your idols besides Daniel Alfredson. So, <laughs> so Mike Fisher is a bit of a disappointment now. But at the time, I loved his game. 
Yeah, no, that's a great answer. And, and truth be told about what you said there, geez, he has gone <laughs> off the deep end, I guess, living in, in Tennessee for too long, I guess, uh, might maybe put two wires across, but I know Pilsy was a big Fisher fan too, growing up. Oh yeah. yeah. Like the, the two way forwards like that, that was such an underrated part of the game at that point when you had the hosts, the Alfies, the Havlats, like the, the goal scoring was there, but Someone had to be back on defense as well. And Mike Fisher, yeah. two-way, two-way guy, was definitely in the clutch. Now, um, do you have any Sens jerseys, uh, Alicia? And if you do, who do you have? Ooh, I have – I can't rival Kevin Lee, but uh, him and I are <laughs> uh, game-worn jersey collectors, so I have oh, some. Cool. That's um, awesome. My favorite that I have is uh, probably the Daniel Alferson retirement night. I got the one that Ryan Dzingel wore in warm-up, and I actually cool. got both of them to sign it. Oh, awesome. Which one was that? Because I know they, th- all the players were wearing different jerseys from throughout his years. Yeah. Unfortunately, it was the boring uh, white 3D logo. Oh, well, still sweet. I remember oh, cool. that night. Yeah. That was so cool seeing them all fly around. Were you, you were at the game then, or did you just yeah. get it afterwards? No, I was at the game, for sure. That, that was awesome. What a night. What a night seeing that, that jersey go up. And uh, he, he came out for warm-ups, too. Remember that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Classic. Oh, yeah. Amazing. I heard a, a little story. I don't know how verifiable it is, but they tried to get him to play in that game, but it was an insurance thing that he couldn't like come back, play one game and then re-retire. Imagine that. Just, I mean, it was like two years after he retired. He probably still could have played oh, if yeah. his back could have held up, but yeah. he left. I mean, he led the Red Wings in scoring his last season. I mean, yeah. you probably should censor that, that word there <laughs> that he wasn't playing in Ottawa, but even still, I think that that's an awesome uh, a little kind of feather in his cap that he could still play despite, you know, injuries taking a toll throughout uh, the back half of his career. Yeah. I guess that kind of t- – go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I was wondering if he didn't have Chris Kelly's skates anymore. I know, yeah, that's so cool. I mean, such a such a lucky coincidence that he was able to. He also said if they won the Cup in 07, he was just going to retire. Oh, I didn't hear that, but I don't blame him. Man, riding off into the sunset is an epic move. Like, that's yeah. – I know, I'm wondering about that, my ball hockey career. <laughs> <laughs> there you, I mean, four-time champ, as recently as this this summer, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, we won. Uh, it was in randomly Laval, um, Quebec, and that was uh, – it. unfortunately, I had a bit of an injury, so I didn't get to finish the finals, but uh, still, we won, so I'm happy. But we'll see. See what the future has. I don't know if I'll keep continuing with Team Canada or uh, I might have to migrate to their Masters team, which is their over 35. <laughs> hey, you're all good you're bringing a lot of a lot of hardware with you were you yeah. almost like Blair Turnbull then celebrating that one it was her oh, yeah. right that was celebrating injured at, at the Olympics yeah um yeah I tore my hamstring in a game before so it was a little bit pretty close to her I actually have one of her game worn jerseys too oh, nice. sick. That, yeah. again nice power forward that's, yeah, that's definitely exactly. her style of game too Sucks what happened uh, yesterday Well, when this comes out. But uh, with the U.S. getting the better, the, with the women's world, you confident Canada is going to bounce back? I actually couldn't watch today's game, so it's hard for me to say because the U.S. is obviously right. who they're going to probably play in the finals. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm cheering on my friend Jamie Lee Ratchery, who's been on Team Canada Ball Hockey, so I'm hoping she has a big game whenever they meet U.S. again. Yeah, I grew up playing against her. She played oh, double-A yeah. boys hockey. Yeah, growing wow. up, she was on the Canada Blazers. I remember yep. that very very well. I was on the Sting at the time, and she was unbelievable. She definitely scored a couple on me. I'm not even going to deny it. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, she got an unreal <laughs> shot from, from what yeah. I remember, and, and it certainly contributed, I guess, at ball hockey as well, but she was a, a big part of that team in, in uh, Pyeongchang. Yeah, oh yeah, I was so excited for her, and then uh, I actually met up with her at a Sens Habs game last season in Montreal. She happened to be there; they were honoring her. A couple other places, I forget who else was there, and met up with her afterwards. Got to hold her gold medal, so it was pretty sick. Oh yeah, that is sick. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, that wasn't the game they got dummied, was it? Yeah, unfortunately, it was. Pillsy was there too. Yeah, yeah I, was- I was there. That was a tough one, Alicia. Yeah, I was unfortunately like second row, uh, so I had a lot of habs fans oh. here with me the whole time. That's the worst. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, I want I want to talk about uh, the ball hockey aspect of this because, yeah. like you said, it, it sounds like there's a lot of kind of uh, merging between ice hockey and ball hockey. Now, did you play a lot of ice hockey growing up as well, or did you kind of decide you were going to stick with ball hockey at an early age, or how do, how does that kind of uh, transition mm-hmm. go there? Uh, I've been playing ice hockey since I was five years old so um I played boys hockey until I couldn't anymore then I played women's hockey 
And then I went to University of Guelph, played for their varsity team. Nice. And then I got scouted to play in the CWHL, so I played for the Brampton Thunder. Uh, okay. Got to play with, like, Jaina Hefford, Vicky Sonahara, Lori Dupuy, like, a bunch of Team USA, Team Canada players, Jillian App, Sherry Piper. So some pretty big names. It was uh, – I was just happy to be there because – and getting to play with girls I grew up idolizing was yeah. awesome. And then uh, when I moved back to Ottawa, um, ice hockey, I just started playing men's beer league, which wasn't really a big thing. And then a friend of me, friend of mine, sorry, got me into ball hockey and the rest is history. Wow. Yeah. So what are the biggest differences uh, you find between ice and ball hockey? Uh, clearly they running, wear skates but... <laughs> and ice hockey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Not a huge amount. I guess the big thing I find a lot of people struggle with with ball hockey, especially in the arena leagues, is that they get the ball and they stop running. And I was like, if you keep running, you can make so much happen. And yep. especially with ball hockey, they have a floating blue line, which I don't know if you guys are aware of. Oh, no. Um, How does that work? Like soccer, so when, like last last person back? No, it's uh, once you gain the offensive zone with the ball, um, you now have half the rink to play it. Oh, cool. Okay, yeah, that's cool. So it's awesome on power plays you can really stretch the players yeah. open and all that it's it's crazy because you would think like why would you have a floating blue line and ball because i have to run half the rink now um right. but, but yeah it opens up the game a lot more and it's a sport that i don't understand why it's not an olympic sport like Honestly, yeah yeah it should be didn't they have skateboarding in the olympics yeah like it's so weird but like oh, the wow. men's side especially like their games are so intense like there's usually fighting and it's like it's just unreal like um there's a couple nhl players or prospects that are in there Nick martell plays for team canada men's team he's been in i think he was on the battle rockets this year uh he's an unru- unreal ball hockey player i know Definitely alex burrows is that yeah, well, they're in the, they're ball in the ball hall of fame player. together now yeah yeah they're yeah. He's a hall of famer <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah, he yeah he definitely is That's um awesome. roberto luongo's brother used to be goalie for canada too no way oh yeah. awesome yeah, That's so cool. Hey, uh, Alicia, let me ask you this, because whether it's that one or I don't know how many rules are different between ball hockey and ice hockey, but is there anything that you wish, whether it's the NHL or ice hockey, would implement from ball hockey? Uh, I guess really the floating blue line is the only real difference in the rules. So okay. it'd be okay. interesting to have that for sure, especially like any power plays, man. Like think how much space. If you have a quick team, like that's so much space to work with. Yeah, but I mean, then strategy, I'm assuming there's not as many, like, because in, in the NHL, right, you work it to the top of the umbrella, shots on net, go for rebounds. I'm assuming there's not, you're not just winding up at, at half, or is that kind of a similar strategy? Yeah, there's still yeah. umbrella, still a huge thing. Um, but it's, it's if you have speedy runners, like, you know how, like, sometimes teams will send someone out near the blue to run or come back in and kind of pick up the puck yep. and just kind of come on Timmy the Timmy does that like, a lot. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So, like, think of that. If Timmy had that much room and opening, like, and no one would stop him. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, that would be. I'm. I'm now thinking like McDavid it would just be the easy. Like, oh, yeah. he would. He would get a goal every power play. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Easily, no one could stop him. <laughs> yeah, and the goal is like, or what? Like from the Uber, and Andy's like, oh shit, <laughs> just coming down. <laughs> Where it's all, oh, man. That's that's great. So great question by me. There's only one rule that's different. So good, good question. Yeah. But it would actually be kind of cool um, <laughs> to have that as an ability in the NHL. So let's talk about the Sens coming up this this yep. season. Obviously, the offseason went great. Do you think they did enough, though, to be a playoff team this upcoming year? Uh, I still think they're just outside. Obviously, everyone wants Chitra, and, and I would if it's not too expensive. Um, it'll be interesting. I guess the first 20 games will kind of show, and if um, DJ still has a job after that, because I know we've been struggling at the beginning of the season. Um, I think we're just on the outside, but – and injuries you never know really so like we'll see how everyone kind of flushes out in the atlantic i don't think i feel like florida might be the one if that bumps out if we do get in florida's over under for points this year from our friends at bet online is 105 i am hammering the under on that yeah. oh 100 percent. like i'm sorry I, I love rudolph falsers but he's now their second yes. line winger like, i'm a big rudolph falsers fan as well biggest, Alicia. the biggest i know I do like him, but I don't think he's like he didn't make the sense when we were terrible. Um, moving past that, though, who do you think is going to be a big breakout candidate for the Sens this year, Alicia? Ooh, uh, I'm hoping Shane Pinto, but nice, okay. Yeah, I'm hoping he does well, and it's kind of like because obviously he's kind of slotted in the third spot, probably. Mm-hmm. 
Um, it'd be nice if you can kind of like push to be like, hey, I should be in the second line. But obviously, our top six is so sick right now. I'm yeah. so excited for that. But uh, I feel like Shane Pinto, I hope he has a good year, especially after the injury. Yeah, I like that. And then, I mean, you talked about being a winger yourself. Like, at what point do you look at the top six as being set? Like, I know it's important to get chemistry with the same players, and, and that's obviously a, a part of success. But how long are you willing to keep the top six? Everyone similarly has the same one, where it's Debrinket and Giroux with, with Timmy, and then you keep Norris, Kachuk, Batherson together. How many games do you give that? About 10? Because if we're giving DJ 20 to 30, how long before he starts feeling the seat get a little hotter and he's like, I need to throw these in a blender? Uh, yeah, probably about 10. But uh, was it you guys who mentioned Watson going up there? I had a joke today because somebody, uh, Giroux and Debrinkett were practicing together today and Watson yeah. was in the background of the photo. And I was like, <laughs> wouldn't it just be a DJ move? Even if it's just a troll for one practice, just to watch yeah. the internet melt down. Imagine yeah. Watson, Giroux, and Debrinkett pills. No, when Imagine they go back that. to Michigan, Ross, when they go back to Detroit, get w- Waddy lit it up last time. So get him on that uh, that line. Yeah, but throw Norris in the middle. Get the Michigan boys all Love out there it. together. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Uh, by the way, Debrinkett shoots right. I got roasted because he plays <laughs> left wing so much. I'm usually pretty good at the lefty righty, so I gotta put hand up on that one. Um, yeah. You said you like playing your off wing. What what does yeah. that open up for you? Is it just the getting the shot off quicker, or are there other oh, yeah. elements of the game that that helps? Uh no, definitely getting the shot off quicker, and it's easier to make that pass to the back door than instead of well, I guess you can make the back door pass either side. But no, definitely the one timer. Even the one timer fake to the back door. I love that play. It's probably my bread and butter. But uh, if only someone would go there, but not always. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you, you need someone there that's for sure now you talked about being a jersey collector so do you have any current sends jerseys if not who is your next sends jersey you're going to be going after and what color uh i do have a reverse retro kachuk i got a jimmy last year his black one um i'm definitely eyeballing a drew because uh yeah that is amazing that was i was literally i think i don't know if you guys saw on twitter I think I did it back in March. I posted a picture in which I said Drew in the Sens uniform. Um, it was actually my brother-in-law, and he looks like spitting image of Drew, and he's a huge nice. Sens fan. So I posted that, and it got, I think, liked like 300 times or something stupid, oh, and I yeah. think everyone actually thought it was him, but it wasn't. It's my brother-in-law. So I'm hyped so for Drew. <laughs> <laughs> and you think, I mean, at this age, you think he still he still got it? How, what's your point projection or like ballpark for, for Drew? Ooh. Uh, I hope 50, maybe 60, but I think like if he sticks the year with Debrinkin, I still, still, I don't think that's hard at all. I know, right? Yeah. Can be I'm, so like, fun. I know. I actually re- got season tickets. We stopped after 2018, I think was our last season. Now we, we decided to get our season tickets again. So yes. I'm excited. Are you coming to home opener? Meeting. Oh yeah. hundred percent. We'll see you there. All right. Awesome. Alicia, we're fired up to see you at the home opener and we want to make sure that everyone's giving you a follow on twitter at desmir04 awesome appreciate you being a Sun central citizen we'll see you at the home opener perfect see you then stick taps to alicia for joining us really enjoyed that conversation pilsy i think that's the first time we've had two guests on the same show since we had pat micheletti and frankie mcdonald on the same episode Wow. Yeah. That, I mean, that just shows our range. We got some range on uh, this podcast, that's for sure. And Ross, we've been racking up so many interviews that, uh, hey, we, we want to get them all out to you as soon as possible. So that's what we're doing here. And two great guests in Corey and Alicia. Talk about range. How about the shooting range of our next guest coming on Friday? Oh, yeah. You're going to be excited about that. We're just about to record now. Stay tuned on Twitter at Send Central for a tease of what's to come right here on LOSP. But for today, we say goodbye. Next time you hear us, it will be the month that Sense Hockey begins, at least preseason Sense <laughs> Hockey. Yes. But for today, we say goodbye. For Brandon Piller, I'm Ross Levitan. This has been the Locked On Senators podcast, your team every day. <laughs>